started our worship service this morning. Good to see you. Uh, we're going to start off with some scripture. If you want to stand, please. And our scripture this morning is from Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. All right, will you worship with us this morning? spirit 
and in truth. And may we leave here saying, truly, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. For you alone are worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, we can stand again, please. Now, I'm trying to hear you guys out there. So you can sing just a little louder and help cover me up would be great. Let's, let's, let's worship God this morning.
chapter 9, and we're going to look at, uh, folks, listen, I hope you were paying attention to the Psalms this morning, all right? I mean, uh, we didn't plan this, okay? I mean, he just, uh, uh, yeah, I kind of knew uh, the Psalms that he had picked out, uh, but I just prayed and said, Lord, what are you going to preach on? And this is the, the text and the sermon that he gave me, but it's just amazing to me how uh, God is just speaking to you this morning, I hope he is anyways, about the love that God has for us. And, uh, and so we're going to look at not just the love of God, but the grace and the kindness that is shown uh, from our loving uh, God. And so I'm going to start off with a uh, kind of a, as an introduction here, uh, rather lengthy. It's not too lengthy, okay? But just bear with me, all right? But there's an article that was written uh, that illustrates this concept of grace. Uh, and it was written by Charles Stanley. Most of you have heard of Charles Stanley, okay? And so listen to what Charles Stanley said. He said, one of my more memorable seminary professors had a way, uh, had a practical way of illustrating to his students this concept of grace. And he goes on and he says this, at the end of his evangelism course, he would distribute the exam with the caution to read it all of the way through before beginning to answer any of the questions. And so this caution uh, was given uh, by the instructor, but then it was also written at the top of the exam as well. And so it goes on and he says, as we would read the test, it became unquestionably clear to us that we had not studied nearly enough. And the further we read, the worse it became. About halfway through, audible groans could be heard throughout the lecture hall. But then you get to the last page, and on the last page, however, was a note that read like this. You have a choice. You can either complete the exam as given or sign your name at the bottom and in so doing receive an A for this assignment. And so the man goes on to say, we sat there stunned. I mean, was he serious? All we have to do is just sign our name at the bottom and turn it in and get an A. And then slowly the point dawned on us. And one by one, we would turn in our test and silently file out of the room. And Dr. Stanley goes on to say that uh, as he talked to the professor of the class afterwards, he shared some of the reactions that he had received throughout the years. And he said this, that some students would begin to take the exam without reading all of the way through, and they would sweat it out for the entire two hours, and then they would uh, uh, finally get to the last page. And then others would read the first couple of pages, and they would become so angry that they would simply turn their test in blank, storming out without signing the paper, and they never realized what was available, and because of that, they lost out totally on the A. And then he goes on to say this, that one guy, he read the entire test, including the note at the end, but he decided to take the test anyways. He didn't want to receive any grace, all right? He didn't want any gift. He wanted to earn his grade. And so by doing that, well, he earned his C plus, all right? I mean, he could have easily had an A, but he wanted to work hard as, as hard as he could, and he earned a C plus. Now, do you understand, though, that that is the mindset of many people today? There are many that believe that they can simply work hard enough to earn salvation. Can I tell you this morning that there's, there are not enough good works that you can do out there, out there in this world to earn your salvation? Salvation is not by words. Listen, the works comes as a result of the faith. You don't work to be saved. You work because you are saved. Amen? And so it's the works that comes after the faith. You are saved by grace through what? 
through faith, and that not of yourselves. It, it is the gift of God. And so salvation, and when we talk about salvation, it is not about our works. It's not about you earning that, that salvation. It's not about being good enough. There are people that will say, well, I just got to live a good enough life, and I will earn or I'll be good enough to earn my way into heaven. And so I'm here today this morning. It is impossible. Impossible. You will not do enough good works. You will not be good enough. Listen, the, the simple concept of this is this, and it's that thing called grace, all right? That God is a, a gracious God. The price has been paid, and all you and I have to do is accept the free gift of salvation that has been offered unto us. Now, in our text today, let me kind of give you a, a little context of our text this morning. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 9. And, and what we find here in these verses it is a beautiful uh, portrait or, or an example of grace, all right? I mean, it's really just a striking picture of salvation by grace, okay? Uh, now, we're going to talk about this guy named David, and we understand this, but let me kind of set the context for you, all right? You need to understand that David is the king right now at this point. David is the king. But now remember that David had uh, what we might call an arch rival, okay? Uh, but that's really not the best terminology. But but there, there was a guy that didn't really care for David. And his name was Saul, okay? Saul was like the first king. And Saul just simply hated David. And, and by the way, in a world of Saul's, choose to be a David, okay? I mean, you can choose to be like David, and what we're going to find here in our, in our text, but, but there are many Sauls out there. Saul hated David. Saul actually tried uh, on several occasions to kill David. And then there were times when David had the opportunity to kill Saul, but he didn't do it. He didn't take his life. He spared it. And so that's why I say, just because somebody hates you, and that, that means that they're, they're a Saul and you're a David, right, okay? But you can choose to be a David to even your Saul. But now Saul had a son. And Saul's son was Jonathan. And it just so happened that Jonathan and David were best buds, okay? I mean, they were best friends. And so David and Jonathan were best friends. Now, Jonathan had a son. And that's what we're going to look at this, this morning. And that son's name was Mephibosheth, all right? And I'll try to say it the best I can there. But what we're going to find here between David and this encounter with Saul's grandson is a picture of salvation. It's a portrait of God's salvation to you and I that is through the grace that is extended unto us. Let me give you three things, all right? Number one is this. We have a loving Savior. What we're going to find here in our scripture is a, is a picture of our loving Savior. I want to talk to you about, I want to give you three things about our loving Savior. First of all, I want you to notice here the reach of His love. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 9 and look in uh, verse 1 if you would. It says there, now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, if I could just say this by, let me, let me just kind of throw this in, all right? That is a question that you and I could ask ourselves this morning. Is there anybody that I could show kindness to this week? Now, I guarantee you that God probably just put somebody's name on your mind or on your heart. If he didn't, then pray about it, all right? And just pray and say, Lord, who is, tell me somebody. Give me somebody's name that this week that I could show kindness to. Because in a world of, well, the world that we're living in, right? I mean, there are opportunities abound for us to go out and to show the kindness and the grace of God to somebody this week. Amen? Amen. That is an opportunity that we can all take. But now I want you to notice there the word anyone. In verse 1, in the, in the King James, the, the word is any. This reminds 
me that there's a, the love of God is an unconditional love. That, that God's love for us. And listen, God did not just send His Son Jesus to die for just a few, but that Jesus came into this world and He lived that sinless life and He went to the cross and He was the sacrifice not just for the sins of a few, but for the whole world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, look at what it says. In 1 John 2, it says that God, that He Himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. When Jesus died on that cross, He died for sin once and for all. Now, this is where sometimes we have some debate in our theology about this, and sometimes people don't understand this, so listen carefully about to say, because I want you to make sure, I, I want you to, I want to make sure you understand what I'm about to say. Listen carefully now. When Jesus died on the cross, He didn't just die for the sins that you have already committed, He has died for the sins that you will commit in the future. All sin. Every sin for all of eternity. All right? I understand that. Because sometimes you're going to talk to people and they're going to say, well, yes, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. But when they say that, what they're saying is the sin that they have committed in the past, but not necessarily the sin they're going to commit tomorrow. Hey, listen, I believe in a loving Savior that died for my sin in the past, present, and future. Now, I still need to ask for forgiveness of that sin. When the Holy Spirit says, hey, you just sinned, I need to say, Lord, forgive me, I have sinned. But I will receive that forgiveness. But notice here the reach of His love. It, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And He died for all. Now that's not to say that all will be saved. There will be those that reject the free gift of salvation. There will be those that do not understand the grace of God and they will reject the love of God even though Jesus has already died for the sin of the world. Jesus died for all. You know the verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He, what? That he gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever, hey, I'm a whosoever. You are a whosoever. And that is the, the reach of His love. That when we look at salvation, salvation is not just offered to a select few, but salvation is for anyone. A whosoever. Let me tell you something, about, something else about our loving Savior. Let's talk about the reality of His love. The reality of His love. Go to verse 2 now. Chapter 9, verse 2. Now keep in mind... In verse 1, David said, Is there still anyone? Is there anyone? He's looking for anybody. But now look in verse 2 here. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Verse 3. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God. And Zima said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is laying in his seat. So David, he reaches out to one of the servants of the house of Saul, this servant by the name of Zima, and David says, Hey, is there anybody? Is there anyone that is left in Saul's family that I could show some kindness to? And so Zima says, Why, well, yes, matter of fact, Saul has a grandson, and that grandson goes by the name of Mephibosheth. Now, he doesn't tell us that in verse 3. Matter of fact, in verse 3, he says, There is a son of Jonathan who is what? Who is laying in his feet. David is not concerned with the fact that this, man, this boy or this guy is laying in his feet. He simply says, Where is he at? Bring him to me. I, I want to I wanna meet you. I, I wanna, I'm searching. Listen, remember what I'm saying here. In verse 1, David said, is there anyone? But now what we find here is uh, it goes from a universal opportunity to an intimate experience. You understand what I'm saying here? This is the reality of a loving Savior. The reality is this, that yes, 
God has provided a universal opportunity that salvation is open to anyone and everyone, but when God calls your name, it becomes a personal experience. It, it kind of goes like this. There's a verse over in John chapter 1. I didn't give you this, brother, all right? So, so you're not going to have this on the screen, but listen. There's a verse over in John chapter 1 where John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sins of the world. That is universal. I mean, it's one thing for you to sit there and say, Well, yes, I believe that God sent His Son and that Son Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world. But it is a totally different thing for you to sit there and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away my sin. You understand what I'm saying? There's got to be a personal experience there. It goes from universal, the sins of the world, to personal, where Jesus died on the cross for my sin. This is the reality of His love. I've heard preachers say this all the time. I've heard preachers say that, that if I was the only person to ever walk the face of this earth, then God still would have sent His Son Jesus and He still would have went to the cross and died on the cross even if it was just for me. That's the reality. Now let me tell you about the result of His love. What's the result of a loving Savior? Go to verse 4 now. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Akir, the son of Aniel, in Lo. Debar, lo, Debar. Now look, go to verse 5. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Malkir, the son of Amiel, from where? From lo, Debar. Mephibosheth has been summoned by the king to appear. He, he, he knows that the king is searching him out, and so he is taken from the house in a place uh, that is called Lodabar. Now you say, what is so uh, what, what's so significant about this place called Lodabar? All right. Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay, Lodabar is translated from the Hebrew, and it, it, it literally literally means this: it is a place of no pasture. In other words, where Mephibosheth is living is in a dry, barren land. You understand what he's saying here? He has been sought out by the king and he has been taken out of a dry and barren land into a much better place. He is going to end up in the king's palace. Listen, folks, I don't know about you, but that is, that is exactly a picture of salvation. Salvation is simply this, is that I have a loving Savior that sought me and he bought me when he called my name. And just like Mephibosheth, I'm crippled in my feet. I couldn't get to him. So he came to me and he picked me up out of the dry and barren land and took me to his palace. Amen. Folks, that's salvation. Amen. Psalm 40, verse 2. I love what the psalmist says. He brought me up. Look at it. He brought me up out of a horrible pit. Out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. Or in other words, he established my steps. What we find here in these verses is a picture of salvation where David, David portrays the loving Savior. Now, number two is this. Not only do we see a loving Savior, but what we also find here is a lost sinner. A lost sinner. Go to verse 6 now if you would. Look at what it says in verse 6. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. Now, I believe I need to stop at this point and I need to make sure that we all understand something, all right? Because in that day and time, when a new king took over, all right, when a new king began to reign, then it was pretty much customary during that time where the new king would take the family of the previous dynasty or the previous king, all of their family, and they would be taken out and they would be executed. They killed every single one of them. Now, why would they do that? Because they didn't want anybody else to to try to rise up and to, to gain the, the throne, all right? They said, hey, I'm king now, 
So, so to, to get rid of any competition, I'm going to kill the rest of the family. Now put yourself in the fitness shoes, all right? I, I know that was a bad pun because he's crippled in the feet, okay? <laughs> I know that's terrible. I know. But picture this. You are sitting there minding your own business in a dry and barren land called Lodabar, and you hear that the king, King David, is seeking you out. You have been summoned to appear before the king, and now you are taken to the king, and now that you are in the presence of the king, I would do exactly what he did. I would fall down on my face, and I would say, have mercy on me. That's what he does. I mean, look in verse 6. It says that he fell on his face and he prostrated himself. He is flat out on the ground. He's not in that wheelchair. But he is flat out on the ground in front of the king. And he is probably just scared to death. And he is simply waiting for King David to say, You are going to be taken out and executed. You are a family member of Saul. And he says, but then what does he hear? He hears David say his name. David called his name. I said it a moment ago, but I'm going to say it again. Let me, tell, let me say something. Listen, when we talk about a lost sinner, every single one of us that have been saved by the grace of God, you are a lost sinner in need of a loving Savior. That's salvation. That I am simply a sinner saved by grace. That I don't deserve it. Mephibosheth is there in front of the king and he, uh, he understands that the king has the power to, to execute him, to end his life. He cries out in mercy. This is exactly what we do as a lost sinner. When God calls your name, you better cry out in mercy and say, God, you are gracious and you are merciful and you are loving. Forgive me and save me. Amen. It's a picture of salvation. So when God calls your name, you better answer. He said his name, Mephibosheth. Not only did God call, God will call your name. But let me tell you something else, else. Something else, God will calm your fears. He'll calm your fears. Look at verse 7. These are some of the sweetest words that we find all throughout the word of God. He says in verse 7, So David said to him, Do not fear. Don't be afraid. Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of, your, of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Now, can I read the Baptist translation of that? Not only does it say bread, but it says fried chicken. You just didn't know that was in there, all right? And you will eat bread at my table, what? Continually. Hey, listen, if I'm a Mephibosheth, that's the best news I've heard in a long time. That I am now, uh, my, my fears are called. David has said, listen, you don't have to be afraid. I'm not going to kill you. But here's what I am going to do for you. I'm going to restore all of the land of your grandfather Saul back to you. And not only that, but you can sit and you can eat as much as you want to eat. I'm telling you, yeah, he had to be back in this all right. Now, I love his response. I love his response. This should be our response. Because we're a lost sinner, saved by grace. Look in verse 8. He bowed himself. You know what we call that? We call that humility. A, a prideful man does not come to Jesus for salvation. Salvation is going to begin when you humble yourself and you realize you can't save yourself. And that you're a lost sinner and even a loving Savior. So look at what he said. He bowed himself and he said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Every single one of us under the sound of my voice could say the exact same thing. Lord, I am nothing but a dead dog. I don't deserve salvation. The only way I have been granted salvation is because you are a gracious Kind and loving Savior. And that's it. And Mephibosheth understands that. He says, what is it to you, the king, 
That, that you would look upon me a dead dog. Listen to what I'm saying. When we began to realize that we were lost and we were on our way to a devil's hell, then that's a fact that, listen, that ought to put a little fear in us. It should. But then the same Holy Spirit that reveals our lost state also reveals to us a loving Savior. We're a lost sinner. Number one, a loving Savior. And then number three is this. We have a lasting salvation. A lasting salvation. I, I want to read something here for just a minute. And uh, just, just bear with me, all right? My uh, Schofield. I, I, always want to, I always want to say Spurgeon, but I, and I forget it. Schofield. In my Schofield Bible, it says this. That when we read chapter 9, it is a striking picture of salvation by grace. And then it says this, grace is kindness to a helpless one. Can, can I just encourage you to show some grace to a helpless somebody this week? I guarantee you that if you will pray today and say, Lord, this week when you put somebody, when I cross paths with somebody this week that I know that they need some help, may I extend your grace and your kindness to them. That's what I said earlier. And then he says this, that grace is kindness to a helpless one. It gives a place of privilege to its recipient. Mephibosheth now finds himself sitting continually at the table eating as much bread as he wants to eat. But not only that, it sustains him. Listen to what I'm about to say. Salvation is a lasting thing. You want to know how long it lasts? For all of eternity. The day that you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart is the day of salvation. And that is when your day of eternal life truly began. When Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly, the abundant life that he spoke of there in John chapter 10, that abundant life began at the day of salvation. You're already living the eternal life. So, so let's, let's understand that there's a lasting salvation. Let me give you three things that I've done. Salvation provides fulfillment. Salvation provides fulfillment. Go to verse 9 if you would. And look what he says here. And the king called to see the Saul's servant. And he said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table. What? Always. That's it. He is going to eat bread there always. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Remember this. That good old Mephibosheth, he was a crippled man. He is lame in his feet. He cannot walk. He was living in a dry and barren land. And now the king has said, hey, Ziba, you were a servant of Saul. Now I have given back to old Mephibosheth all of the land that belonged to him. And now you're going to go out there and you're going to till the land and you're going to bring in the fruit and the produce. You're going to bring all that stuff in while he sits here at the table and eats continually. Always. I, I, can I just say this? I, I, there is a fulfillment when, when you are truly saved, when, when you understand that you've truly been born again, there's an amazing sense of peace and joy and fulfillment that this world can't give you. It only comes from salvation. Knowing that you're not, that, that, that you may be in this world, but you're not of this world. Knowing that you don't belong here. That you're going to go to a much better place. Remember Psalm 23, right? David says, you prepare a table before me, what? In the presence of my enemies. You ever wondered how David could sit down at a, at a, at a table, a, a buffet banquet, and just eat and eat and eat with the enemies right out there? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy? And that's exactly what we find here. Salvation provides fulfillment. Not only that, but listen. Salvation provides a family. 
When you become a child of God, you are now part of what we call the family of God. The universal family of God. Go to verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, He shall eat at my table like one of the what? The king's sons. That's salvation. You were apart from Christ. You need to, you need to be reconciled to God. And the way you are reconciled to God is through the atoning of Jesus Christ on the cross. And when you became a child of God, now you're part of the family of God. Salvation gives you a place in the family. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Amen? Amen. I, I, love the, I love the verse, John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as believed and received. There's believing and received. To as many as received him, he gave them the right to become what? To become children of God. Sons and daughters of God. Mephibosheth is like one of the king's sons. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. Uh, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called what? Children of God. Glad. I'm part of the family of God. You know, this world can give you a lot. <laughs> this world, this world can offer you everything. This world can give you just about anything. But there's one thing this world cannot give you, and that is salvation. Now listen, listen though. Your family, your family may give you a lot of things. Your family can provide you with everything that you need in this world to survive and to thrive, but your family cannot give you salvation. You understand what I'm saying by that? What I'm saying is this, is just because granddad might be saved doesn't mean that granddad's salvation automatically transfers to you. Salvation is personal. Mephibosheth is the grandson, but he wasn't saved. Just because Jonathan or Saul may have been, your family may provide everything that you need, but you need to come to Jesus for salvation. Salvation provides a family. And then the last thing is this. Salvation provides a future. When you have salvation and none other than Jesus, you have a future. Look at verse 13. We're done. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. Again, we need to kind of understand that this is an Old Testament portrait of the New Testament Christian. For it, for it to say that he dwelt in Jerusalem, that's like saying for the New Testament Christian, we're going to dwell in heaven. Does that make sense? We're going to dwell, we're going to abide forever and ever in a place that we call heaven. Now, I love it. It says it again. This is like the third time, right? You know, it's like the third time. He ate continually at the king's table. He never got up. He wouldn't leave. I wouldn't either. Why would you? Why would you want to throw it all away? Why would the finish have to say, you know what? I'm a cripple. I can't walk. I can't do anything for myself. I can't work. I can't make a living. I, I realize the king has brought me into his palace. He has offered me all of the land that my father saw or my grandfather saw that. He has offered me the opportunity to sit here at the table and to eat as much as I want to eat for all of eternity. He has even uh, told me that the, the Ziba servants are going to serve and do all that work for me and I don't have to do anything. I don't need that. I'm going to go back to the water. I'm going to go back to the dry barren land. So that's foolish. That's crazy. But you understand this is a picture of salvation. And it's sad to say that there are people that will reject salvation. The free gift of God. The graciousness and the kindness of God. And, and you sit there and you try to say, listen, you, let, me, let me explain to you how much God loves you. That God loves you so much that he came seeking after you. Because that's exactly what he does. Jesus came to seek and to save what? The lost. And, and that God is a 
a loving Savior, and He sent His Son Jesus to die on that cross for your sin. And all you have to do is accept the free gift of salvation, and people say, no, thank you. If he was didn't do that, <laughs> where do we find him? We find him at the King's Stadium. He's a smart man. He says, I know where I'm going to be. I'm not going to walk away from such an opportunity. Why would it? But people do. Time and time again. Brother Shane, you come this morning as we prepare for a time of invitation. Hey, listen, put yourself in his shoes. Mephibosheth, living out there in a dry and barren land, no hope, no peace. And now the fear sets in. Because one day, here comes somebody saying, the king wants to see you. The king is searching for you. As soon as you hear those words, Think, the thoughts start to race through your mind. Well, this is it. He's going to kill me. He knows that I'm the, the grandson of Saul. The man that hated him. Tried to kill him. So I know my life is about it. But then you find yourself in the king's path. And the king says, he calls you by your name. And he says, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. I'm going to provide everything that you need for the rest of your life. Folks, listen. It's a clear picture of a loving Savior, a lost sinner, and a lasting salvation. Maybe this morning you just want to come to this altar and you just want to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for doing what I can't do. I can't save myself. Thank you for providing salvation. For me. So there's a decision you need to make. I invite you to come. As we stand as we sing, I want you to come now.